people, I'm sad to say that there are many segments in the church, the supposed religious church, that have forsaken truth. I assure you we're not going to be one of those. I can also assure you that because of that, you can expect to have some persecution. Of course, the trouble is, when that trouble comes, how will you handle it? You're going to stand strong. Amen? Amen and amen. Go to that first screen. We are difference makers in the children as children of God. Would you say amen to that? Amen. Difference makers. How do I know that? From Scripture. Yeah. In the book of Matthew, he tells us, he gives us some good information. Next screen. You are the salt of the earth. Who's he talking to? Talking to you and me, yeah. not the sinners. That's right. They're not very salty. <laughs> you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, now he's kind of, hmm, if it loses its flavor, what happens? How shall it be seasoned? How shall the food be seasoned? Or whatever it's applied to, yeah. are the, will there make a difference? The answer is no. It is good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. This is happening right now in the church, isn't it? The salt, the essence of making a difference has been displaced with let's be as much like the, church, the world as we can be so that we don't offend them when they walk in our door. Seeker friendly. Let's, let's make it friendly when they walk in. I'm not interested in being seeker friendly. I'll just tell you right now. Because that's why we don't have 5,000 people in this church. Because you're not going to hear what you want to hear. You're going to hear what the Word of God says. It doesn't make any difference what I think or you think, really. Am I right? It's going to make a difference. God's going to hold you and me accountable one day when we stand before Him. Yes. And He's going to ask one question. What did you do with this? Right. What did you do with my Word? Did we take it, accept it as the words of God and obey it? Or did we say, well, you know, that was good for them, but man, we're 20 centuries later. We've got to be progressive. I'm troubled with that. Amen. Next screen. You are the light of the world. Not only are you the salt, you change the flavor of things. But when light is introduced, even the littlest, smallest flicker in a totally dark environment, that thing is, that darkness is pierced, isn't it? Yes, it is. yes. Darkness cannot stand against the light. And when he says, you are the light, he doesn't say you have the light, does he? You are the light. You are the essence of God. Jesus was the light. And then he gives that anointing to you and me. The light means that we enlightened what goes on around us. If we will use this right here to speak truth. Now, yes, we need to live an example. But people, until we start speaking the truth, people won't know the truth. And most people are not in church right now. So they're not going to hear some sermon from some bald-headed preacher man. Okay? So how are they going to hear the truth? In Walmart next to you. Right? As you begin to live and speak truth, you're going to be the living gospel. Amen. And amen. I want to, uh, there's, there's a lot of questions that have been asked recently of me because I've taken a strong stand politically uh, in social media. 
And the questions, one, one question here, well, why, why do you get involved in this? Because, uh, you know, you ought to be talking about spiritual stuff, being a clergyman and all. I said, well, if you'll notice, any time I speak, I'm really not talking about trade issues. I'm not discussing immigration, taxation, regulation. Those are all important. Yes, they are. They're important. But I'm talking about the issues that impact yes. just basic morality. There was an interesting priest from Townsend, Maryland that I saw on Facebook that delivered one of the most profound and significant messages to the body of Christ that I've heard yet. Yes. And now keep in mind, this is a Catholic priest, okay? So Father Meeks, he says... I'm going to speak to you pastors, and he even included other Christians. So I'm glad he was talking to me too. But he specifically was wanting to aim at the most high-profile Catholic that we have right now before us, and that would be one Joseph Biden. And he went on to explain why this high-profile Catholic needs to be uncovered so that Catholics would not vote for him. Now this man was not trying to be political. He was trying to show that the teachings of the church, teaching of the word of God, are very specific and those are what he called, and I as well, are non-negotiables. Now, whether or not we decide that the NAFTA treaty is good or bad, we can discuss that till the cows come home. Right. And you and I might differ on that, and we're going to agree to disagree agreeably. Right. And whether or not we raise taxes, lower taxes, or get this or that done, now we can disagree on those issues. Those are negotiable issues. But those issues that have to do with basic morality, yes. we must draw the line in the sand, as Father Meek said, and say, no, no, no. In fact, the very, the very topic of his homily, his sermon was, enough is enough. Amen. And he focused on three things that Mr. Biden and every believer should know about Mr. Biden that he believes and he is espousing in his candidacy. Oh, yeah. Not the least of which, all 15, the last 15 popes apparently have said that the one singular issue facing the United States of America right now is the issue of abortion. Yeah. We have slaughtered 61 million individual persons since we legalized the killing of babies. I can't imagine that number. It's just so abortion. The Democrat Party is the party that espouses abortion. You may be a Democrat, just don't vote Democrat. They are what the priest rightly called the party of death. I agree with that. So abortion was the first issue. Second of issue. The sanctity of marriage. Somewhere I remember God's talking about marriage. Let me think where it would be. Maybe it's in this book. I'm not sure. But he said that it has to do with the man and the woman. Male and female. Seems pretty clear, doesn't it? In fact, so clear that he even designed this, the anatomies of said genders yes. to 
properly propagate the earth. That's right. Right? Amen. So when the Catholic Church draws the line in the sand, and so do we, by the way, Amen. and say that a marriage is between a man and a woman, anyone that says otherwise has now stepped over into absolute doctrinal error opposed to the Word of God. Yes. Make no mistake about it. Perversion has gone amuck in our nation. I'm concerned about it, to say the least. Now, the third thing was, first was abortion, second was sanctity of marriage, third, freedom to worship. Make no mistake about it. It's already beginning where now there are government entities, usually at the local level or at the state level, but it, if we have a Democrat president and administration, you're going to see now it's going to be tentacalized into all, all forms that's going to oppose yeah. us because we're going to speak things they do not want us to speak. And so you're going to see the first level is what I call the doctrine of hindrance, where they begin to hinder us. And then it's going to go to the doctrine of silence. If you can think about it this a moment, the socialistic mindset that the Democratic Party is, is advocating is only one step from totalitarianism. Do you understand that? Only one short step. So in totalitarianism, study any of the, from the time, look, take it, in the late 18th century, from the time the French Revolution on, you're going to see that every time there's a totalitarianism government, one of the first things they do is begin to silence religion. They're going to have to shut down the voices that speak against what they're propagating. And that's what you will have in your nation if we continue to sit on our hands as the people of God. Right. My God, help us. help us. Go to the first screen. Truth number one. All authority. Say that with me. All authority. All authority, All authority on the earth is by how? Divine, Divine appointment. appointment. How do I know that? Let me read you Romans chapter 13. Just a couple of verses, may I? Verse 1, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Now, many years ago when I was first training for the ministry, I, I couldn't understand that concept. See, the ways of God are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts, aren't they? So when I think about even in our, in our past, recent past presidents, and I'm thinking, God put those people in place? See, I'm... It's hard for me to understand. But you and I, we, we kind of have a narrow scope of what things are happening. Mostly surrounding about the three foot around us, right? <laughs> we, we have trouble with the, the world view, the bigger, the kingdom view. But we find, listen to this. In Ezra chapter 6, it says, In the first year of King Cyrus, King Cyrus issued a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be rebuilt, the guy said. Now, who was this guy? Was this some godly, holy man? No, no, no. Mm-mm. This was a wicked evil tyrant. So why in the world is he advocating rebuilding God's temple? Because God controlled his 
heart to lean him toward that. He was using this man to fulfill his plan and his will on the earth. Can you see that? So before he came to that decision, over here, back Somewhere he had to raise up a man by the name of Cyrus and put him in authority so that somewhere down along the line he could do his will. Do you see that? Now somehow we're going to see that these past presidents and the past governors that have ruled unrighteously have been put there for such a time as maybe we're coming into right now to reveal what God wants to do. You see, there was a time when Moses being sent back to Israel, back to Egypt, to turn Israel away from bondage and set them free, he had a problem, and the problem was in a man by the office of Pharaoh. Do you know the Word of God tells us that it is God who, har who hardened his heart and would not allow the people of God to be free for 10 different times until finally God allowed his heart to be so softened, so injured because of all the plagues that he finally said, get out of here, go, go, go. Do you see? God was wanting to demonstrate that he was truly God. And those 10 plagues, let me tell you what, those things did the job. Anybody, all the nations surrounding knew that there was one true God. Yes. And I'm here to tell you, it was the God of the Hebrews. So you see, it was necessary for God to raise up that man, put him in that place as Pharaoh, so that when his time, H-I-S-H, -S capital H, his time came, this man would be in place to fulfill his plan. Can you see that? Yes. So when we see that all authority on earth is by divine appointment, now we can understand what's behind that. Yes. See, God's got a plan, folks, and it's being carried out, and it will not fail. That's right. yes. It will not fail. Will not. Truth number two, God will fulfill his will. Can you say amen? Amen. And he will finish his plan even through ungodly, nasty old people, just like we've been talking. His will will be done. How many people have you heard recently or in the last four years talking about your president and his personality quirks? Hey, I've got problems with some of his personality quirks. I mean, well, I want to get into that. I shudder sometimes when I hear him speak. But there's one thing that I am assured of, that God raised this man up for such a time as this. We have an advocate right now for the church in our president. The man in the Oval Office believes in the sanctity of life, in the sanctity of marriage, in free worship. We are blessed that he is there. Amen. So people's ideas of our president have become clouded because they're not seeing with spiritual eyes what God has done. They're seeing the near, just the way he acts and the things he says. And Look at what he has done in this nation. Truth number three. We Christians are to be in submission. Oh, preacher. Don't say that word. Don't say that word. Say it, Pastor. Go ahead, say it. Well, that means I've got to be weak. And, and what if the guy that I'm supposed to submit to isn't as perfect as me? <laughs> and that's probably the case, isn't it? Yes. Submission. Yeah. Listen. Romans 13, let every soul, every soul, Christian and unchristian, be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the, exhort, the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority, resists the ordinance of God. Did you hear that? 
See, it's one thing to say, I don't like that law. I don't, I don't like the 55 mile per hour law. No. <laughs> Do you? No. I mean, my car wants to go more than that. My wife's car really wants to go yeah. more than that. Pray for this precious lady. But those laws are there for a reason. Aren't they? <laughs> Rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil, it says in Romans 13. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Now, this is some really deep stuff. Are you ready? Do what is good. Well, that's, that's, that's good stuff. Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. In other words... Now this guy is going to not hinder you. Right. He says, for he, the one in authority, is a minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to exercise wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, I like Paul's conclusion, you, now he's talking to the church, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. People listen to me. One of the ways we're going to shine the light of the Lord Jesus is how we deal with those in authority over us. Now I could blend this with church authority as well, not just civil authority. In fact, it's even as maybe even more important to submit to church authority. But nonetheless, God has a system. And if we play his system, all goes well with us. So truth number three, we must be in a submission to established authority. Let's go with number four now. To resist authority is to do what? Displease God. To please the Lord. And when we displease the Lord, there are consequences. Understand this, that how many of you have ever had a speeding ticket? How many of you are lying that you don't have, that you said you hadn't gone? <laughs> you ever tried to talk him out of that? Yeah, sort of. Oh, you're good at it? Sure. Next time I get stopped, I'm going to say, hey, here's a telephone number. Would you mind calling Deacon Phil and right. let him negotiate <laughs> my deal for me? Yeah. You see, there are consequences when we break the law, right? How many times are we seeing, in particularly in the last few years, where people blatantly defy authority and then they get in trouble or even get shot and killed because they are defying authority? And now the ones in authority are being castigated, not the one who defied authority, but the guy that tried to establish or tried to enforce what was established. You see, we are. The things have gone so skewed that now right is wrong and wrong is right. Evil is good and good is evil. And what are we supposed to do here, folks? We've got to get back to this. We've got to get back to this. For the Word of God is where the truth is. Amen. Truth number five. Are we supposed to just go, oh, well, that guy's going to, or that gal, whoever's the governor or the president, they're going to do what they want to do, so we're just going to hang tight and hope everything works out. No. What's Paul have to say about it? Listen to it. Pray for those. Well, he says exhort. First of all, that supplication prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men see we're supposed to pray for everyone for kings and all those in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence conditions we tend to complain about what we see around us in our, in our land don't we and yet, how many of us are truly praying for those people in authority to make the right decisions and to do what is right? 
We've got to be doing that. Boy, today, in this day and age, this is more important now than ever. Do you think it really makes a difference? Yes, it does. I don't know I, if I could tell you how many times someone sat across my desk from me and said, I just don't really feel like prayer makes any difference. If I had a dollar for every one of those, man, I'd have me some loot. They don't believe that when they pray, it makes a difference. Now, granted, you're going to have to pray the will of God for there to make a difference, aren't you? But when, it, do you think it's the will of God for his will to be done in President Trump? Let's just use it. Okay. Now, we might not know exactly what that will is on the trade agreement between Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. We might not understand all that. But I think it's the, God, it's the will of the Lord for that man to have the godly wisdom to establish that law so everybody's working well with it, don't you? Yes, so Father, I pray for my president that he'll have your wisdom concerning such and such. I believe the instant the father hears that, he goes, done. And he begins to to mold and form that president mm -hmm. to accomplish what you and I have prayed. Amen. I wonder how many millions of people. You see, I, I, I'm, <laughs> I love it. I get messages from all over the world telling me that I'm praying for your president. I, I probably get 50, 60, 100 a day. People that have no direct benefit or otherwise to our president but yet they realize this is the most powerful man on the planet yes. and it's going to impact them whether they are in Nepal or Singapore or wherever yeah. right yeah. and they're they're praying for it when, the, when our people say they're praying they're praying I mean we got some folks that know how to touch the throne of God so we've got to pray for those in authority we don't have a right to complain if we don't vote and pray. Amen. Amen. Truth number six. The good result of our prayers for those in authority over us is to do what? Lead a quiet and peaceable life. I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm sure you're wanting that. I need that. Truth number seven. Here's the last one. Civil disobedience. I want you to say those terms. Civil. Civil disobedience is sanctioned by God when civil laws or even religious laws counter or defy the word of the Lord. Listen to what they said. Acts chapter 5. They brought Peter and some of the guys that were preaching the gospel before the rulers. When they had brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest asked them, saying, did, you not, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name, in the name of Jesus? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. Boy, now they're, they're being the light. Yeah. And intend to bring this man's blood on us. Now listen to Peter's response. Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Yes. That's it. We must know when to obey and when not to obey those in authority. That's right. Now the day is coming, in fact I guess it's really already here in some ways, where you and I who wear that white robe of righteousness, we are being called upon to defy civil law. Now we'll know when to obey that civil law and when not to. But when they tell you to do something that you know counters God's will, that's when you back off and respectfully say no. Now, when that happens, there might be some repercussions and more than likely there will be. Jesus even teaches his disciples. He said, now in this life, there are going to be tribulations. 
there's going to be persecutions. I want to prepare you ahead of time so that you are not making the decision when they are faced with you right then and that facing is requiring you to do what they say or die. You better make your decision ahead of time. Amen. Had a pastor friend in an African nation, one of our bishops actually, and uh, he was talking about there's in particularly in Niger, Nigeria, kind of central northern area of Africa. There's there's a, a strong Muslim influence. In fact, they're just slaughtering people, Christians, by the hundreds. But one of their tactics is to utilize the children of Christian parents. Now, I want you to picture this. If you're parents, I want you to picture this. They're, they have both you and your wife in handcuffs, and they bring little Johnny, and they put a gun next to little Johnny's head. And they require you to denounce the Lord Jesus as your Savior. Or else, little Johnny's going to die. What would you do? Well, that'd be tough, wouldn't it? He described what it was like when that happened to him. And his daughter was killed instantly because he said, I will not denounce the Lord Jesus. Boom. Daughter's dead. Can that happen in the United States? Can it? Oh, but we're civilized. Civilized? Slaughtering 61 million babies in the womb. Some of them outside of the womb. Civilized? People, we're going to have to wake up. We're going to have to wake up. We have a responsibility as the people of God. Let me read a passage out of Isaiah 60. It says, Arise and shine. Yes. This implies that we're in a sitting position or lying down position. Arise and shine. Just like Matthew 5. Be that light. Arise and shine for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Really? That can happen? Glory on you? Really? Oh, but only God gets glory. He's the one that has the glory, but he's saying he's going to put it on you. Arise, shine for the light. For the glory of the Lord has risen upon you, and behold, the darkness shall cover the earth. It is indeed. For darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen on you. There's something about you and me. There ain't no such thing, Jackson, as a closet Christian. It ought to be wide open for everybody. When you walk by, they're going to go, there's one of those guys right there. Yes, that's true. Right? Yes. It shall be seen upon you. And the Gentiles, those are the people that don't know Jesus. The Gentiles shall come to your light. They're going to see something different about you. They're going to come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. I believe Isaiah looked ahead and saw where we are right this moment. I believe it more than any time. I've preached on this for 40 years, but now this is the time. This is the time when the church is arising. Glory to God. And I'm going to tell you on the authority of God's word, we're winning. Now, this nation is a key to the world. Do you understand? Yes. We have greater control and influence than all the other nations combined. That's right. Amen. 
we have infiltrated the planet with the gospel of the Lord Jesus, this planet. So don't tell me that we are systematically evil. Yeah, we've made mistakes as nations for sure, haven't we? And we've had to repent of it, and we needed to. But God is not finished with the United States of America. Did you hear me? Yes. Don't listen to anybody that says we're going down the drain. We are not going down the drain. Right. We are rising strong and stronger and stronger and stronger. And I declare it in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen. amen. and amen. Stand up on your feet. Praise the Lamb of God. Father, we look to you. You're the solution. You've got the solution to the problems that our nation faces. And we know that you operate in this dispensation through your church. So as for me and this church and Covenant Global Church worldwide, we're going to stand and continue to proclaim and decree the truth of your word, regardless of the consequences. We're going to continue to be the light in the darkness. And we're going to be arising, as Isaiah said. We're not going to be seated. We're arising in the power and the grace of God Almighty, empowered by the Holy Ghost to do the work of the kingdom of God, to finish the work that you began in your earthly ministry. I pray over these ones before me and the ones that will see me or around the world, and I decree that every one of us are strong and powerful in the might of God, and that we are not weak, we are not timid, but we are strong in the glory of God, and it will be upon us to do the work of the kingdom. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. So let's make the decision, saints. Let's make the decision to go all the way with God. Here, God, send me. Here I am. Amen. Praise the Lord. I bless you as you go forth from this place. Go forth empowered with the truth, with a new boldness. No fear. Say, I ain't scared. No spirit of scared in this place. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Let's go in the power of grace and let's remember your names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. You are dismissed.